And the title today is not name of a praying mantis or a cockroach, okay? It's a Greek word meaning disciple, mathetis. It comes from Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Shall we read this together? Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now in these verses, you find that it is all action words. First, Jesus says, go. Go is an action word. Make. It is an action word. But before we go to talking about make disciples, first we have to know what is a disciple. You can't make what you don't know. What is a disciple? If you look in the dictionary, it says, surprisingly, a personal follower of Christ during his life, especially one of the 12 apostles. Not often you find any Christian definition in dictionaries anymore. I was telling the, uh, the people last night that when I had my Android phone a few years back, when I typed J-E-S, it suggests Jesus as one of the options. Now my newer phone doesn't suggest Jesus at all. Some of the Christian words, it is not suggested to you in your, in your auto-typing kind of thing. So what is a disciple? A follower, a student, a pupil of a teacher, a leader, or philosopher, a believer, an apprentice, an admirer, a devotee. Someone who takes up the ways of someone else. Someone who follows completely the teachings of another, making them his rule of life and conduct. That means you are uh, following somebody lock, stock and barrel. His whole lifestyle, his ideologies, his uh, attitudes, his beliefs, everything. And it's not like a teacher. Surprisingly, the Greek term of disciple means more than just a student or a learner. So the question is, what is the difference between a student, a learner, compared to a disciple? For example, um, you see, if I, if, if I use anybody's names here, I don't know whether I'll give you a headache or not, because we're not supposed to worship you, right? Um, but let's say, for example, um, Kang Lee, because she plays piano, okay? For example, if, if I'm a student of music, I learn about music, I study about music, I read about music, I do exams on music. If I am a disciple of a musician, if I'm a disciple of Kang Lee, it's not just the music aspect that I'm learning from her. I will follow her lifestyle, her habits, what time she wakes up, what time she sleeps, the books she reads, the magazines she reads, the food she eats, everything, her ideology, her attitudes, everything I will follow. That is the difference between being just a student and a disciple. For example, we have studied science, we study biology. Any of y'all working in anything that cuts up bodies, deals with bodies? if you're not in the medical line, but have you studied biology before? We study science, we study biology. It doesn't mean that we are biologists. It is just knowledge to us. We may even hate the subject, but because we have no choice, we just study it for the sake of taking the exam. Do we believe everything we read? Sometimes not. I remember one of the things that caught my attention was that when I was studying science, they told me caffeine was bad for the genes. But it's like, you know, our family has been drinking coffee since my great-grandmother kind of thing, and I don't think we are retarded in any form, okay? So I studied that, and I have to answer that for the exam because that's what the exam requires. But do I believe it? No. I just choose, don't follow that. Same thing, I was doing uh, home science, domestic science. My teacher will tell us, um, for the exam, if they ask you what is a balanced breakfast, do not write nasi lemak, fried bihun, porridge. This is not the answer they want. They want bread, milk. Okay? So as a student, we pick and choose what we want to follow. 
But as a disciple, you are required to follow 100% wholeheartedly. When we are a student, we have a choice. We choose. But when you are a disciple, your choice has already been made. If you choose to follow that person, you are a disciple of Jesus, means you already have no more choice. Everything that Jesus does, we follow. Everything that Jesus says, we obey. Everything that Jesus says is no good, we have to follow and say it is no good and don't touch it. So my question today is, are you a student of Jesus or are you a disciple of Jesus? The things that we have done, the services we have attended, the Bible studies we have learned, do we pick and choose these teachings and apply those which we want in our lives? Or are we a disciple of Jesus that even the things that you don't like and the things that you are not doing, you will change your life such that you will follow what Jesus says and change your lifestyle to follow the lifestyle that he wants. So are you a student of Jesus or are you a disciple of Jesus? We cannot make what we don't know. We cannot make disciples if we don't know what a disciple is. Having Jesus in our lives makes us believers, makes us the children of God. It does not automatically make us a disciple of Jesus. Because being a disciple is something that you consciously choose to do. And the Bible, Jesus doesn't, doesn't whitewash the thing and say that, oh, become my followers uh, and then life will be fine. On the contrary, Jesus never said life will be fine and you will have sunshine every day. Not that. Jesus said, count the cost. Jesus said, count the cost. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, when somebody took the cross, he was going on a one-way street. He was going to die. Because nobody else would pick up the cross. We know the stories in the Bible about Roman times. When you pick up the cross, means you are going for your execution. So when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, you are saying that I am actually denying my life. I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to die to my former self and I'm going to take the ways of Jesus. So are you a student of Jesus or are you a disciple of Jesus? In those times, disciples of Jesus were called little Christ. I remember in my youth, we used to have this, this word game. You know, you spell the word Christian, C-H-R-I-S-T, I-A-N. Take away C-H-R-I-S-T. What do you have left? I-A-N. I am nothing. Because without Christ, I am nothing. So as Christians, if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. As disciples, what are we expected to do? One, you have to make a personal commitment to Jesus. You cannot say, I don't know what I was in for because Jesus tells us very, very clearly. In Mark 3.14, he appointed the twelve whom he named apostles so that they might be with him and they could, he could send them to preach. So the purpose was to send them to preach. Has Jesus changed his mind since then? If we are a student of Jesus, we can choose to read, he appointed the twelve so that they might be with him and forget the other half of the sentence because we are not very good students. Ah. But if you are a disciple, it's everything, 100%. That you have to pay attention that Jesus chose them to send them to preach. And if we are disciples of Jesus, are we included in this statement? Yes or no? I won't force you to answer because uh, whether you answer or not will have to reflect whether you're a student or a disciple, right? Okay, Paul says, my aim is to know him. If we are a student, we can just remember half because not so good student, not A+, plus, right? So we remember, my aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection 
and then we forget the other half of the sentence. But if you are a disciple of Jesus, the other half says to share in his sufferings, to be like him in his death and somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So if you are a student of Jesus, you can choose the nice parts and forget the not so nice parts. But if you are a disciple of Jesus, we pay attention to the nice parts and we also have to pay attention to the not so easy parts. Because a disciple follows the master totally, not just partially. It's not always bad because we enjoy him. Do you enjoy the worship just now? Yes. We don't come to worship God to enjoy him, but it is a byproduct that when you're in the presence of God, you enjoy the presence of the Lord. Just like when you're in the presence of the people who love you and whom you love, you enjoy their company. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When you are a disciple, what do you do? You spend a lot of time with your master. In the olden days, if you are a disciple, it means you are actually removed from your family and you are staying with the master. The master is now your family. And you are, you are an apprentice, you are tutored. If your master decides not to sleep, you cannot sleep. If your master decides to wake up in two hours' time, you have no choice, you have to wake up at the same time. If your master decides to be vegetarian for the whole month, you have to be vegetarian. If your master decides to eat only fish, you eat only fish. You know that kind of thing? You follow your master. You follow the person whom you are adopting his lifestyle because you want to be like him. So when we spend time with Jesus, we are like a mirror reflecting Jesus. Who do you spend time with? I have teachers who speak Mandarin more than Chinese. If during our lunch break, I, uh, they speak to me in Mandarin, my next lesson after lunch, I tend to start speaking Mandarin first to my student because it was so much Mandarin one hour before. But if they are practicing their English with me and we are speaking in English, my next lesson, I automatically start in English first. It just happens. It's not like a, I will speak in English first or I will speak in Mandarin first. It, it's not like that. It is just a natural thing. The people that you spend more time with, you speak like them. You talk like one another. The phrases that your friends use, you will adopt those phrases as well. If you work in Singapore, there are many phrases that a lot of Singaporeans use that Malaysians don't use. So by listening to you talk, we know whether you are more influenced by Singapore or more influenced by JB. There are phrases that you use here in JB that are not used in KL. When I go back Chinese New Year, I can, I can hear the difference between my, my Perak relatives, my KL relatives, and my Southern relatives. You know, the kind of phrases that come out. When we are in Jesus' presence, we should be reflecting Jesus. We are a mirror. But do other people know that you have been with Jesus? Do other people know that you are Jesus' disciples? Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Becoming a disciple for Jesus, go in with eyes wide open. Sometimes when we do sales and sell something, we tell how good the product is. We don't tell lies, but we don't tell the whole truth. We say how good the product is. We do not say how short life the product has, for example. We don't say how much electricity it will consume, even though it is so efficient. We don't say that once it spoils, there is no spare part in Malaysia. 
You know, these are things that we don't say, but we are not lying. We're just not telling the whole truth. But if you're becoming a disciple of Jesus, Jesus is telling you 100% what to expect and come in with eyes wide open. Many promises, many blessings, but also there is difficulty, there is challenges. So do you still want to be a disciple of Jesus? Think about it. Because he says, if you desire to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for Jesus' sake, you will find it. And because of that, it's impossible to be a disciple of Jesus. If not for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not like, um, you know, you put black oil in the car and if your car is old, they say you add something on to it to make it be more efficient. It's not like we have a Christian life going on with God, we have a relationship and to make it better, we add the Holy Spirit. It's not an additive. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an additional thing. But many Christians do not acknowledge their need and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we have been in church for so long that we have come to read the Bible and we can understand superficially many things in the Bible. But in one of my stupid times when I backslided and went away from God, I realized that when I read the Bible, actually, um, I can understand the English part like a comprehension. I understand what it says. But I feel that there is just a, a mental block. It, it, I understand with my mind what it says, but I cannot grasp the truth that is in that passage. I can read to you about um, you lose your life. If, for Jesus' sake, you will find it. We understand it for English sake, that if you give your life up for Jesus you will find it. I understand the English word, but what does that mean? What is the depth of that sentence? Some of you will say, because I lose my life for Jesus, that means I, uh, I may have to die for Christ. But I know there is eternal life in Jesus. That is an understanding that the Holy Spirit gives you. That understanding does not come in an English lesson. But because we have been in church for a long time, we have heard enough speakers, enough sermons that we put two and two together and we make sense of the Bible a little bit more. But when you spend time reading the Word of God, even in the Bible Readathon, even following a program to read the Bible in one year, the, the understanding that you have is actually given to you by the Holy Spirit. It is not your English language or your Chinese language or your Tamil language that helps you understand the Word of God. Am I making sense? I won't ask you to backslide and then don't listen to the Holy Spirit, then you know what I mean. No, it's not that. But um, if you've been less than a perfect Christian and you've backslided before, you will know that sometimes you read the Bible, it makes no sense. Just take my word for it, okay? All right, we need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. That why, that's why Jesus told his disciples that when he leaves, he is not leaving them helpless. He is not abandoning them, but he is sending the Holy Spirit to help them. John 15 is a popular passage that tells how we need to abide in the vine. Many of us Christians are like a power bank. We charge it full, 100%. After that, we remove it from the socket and then we recharge our gadgets, our phones for as many times as the power bank can, can recharge. And then when it goes flat, when our gadgets go flat, everything, then the power bank goes to be recharged. But the power bank in itself cannot recharge itself. Sometimes we are like a power bank because we tap onto Jesus for certain things, for certain areas of our life, then we just carry on. We do not abide in the Lord, as what Pastor Tim said last week. 
We do not spend time continually with Him. And then it comes a point in our time where things are a little too difficult, a little more challenging. And we find that whatever we have, we do not have the strength, we do not have the faith to carry on. Then we run back to Jesus. And then we go and say, God, sorry, I didn't read your word. I didn't go to church. I didn't go cell group. You know, uh, I really need help. God, please save me. Have mercy on me. And God, in his love for us, always does come true. And then we charge again. But if we don't learn from our mistakes, our life will always be like that. We run to God one moment, then we go and live a life on our own. Then we come back to Him again, charge again, and then we run on our own. But God, what God tells us all the time that He wants you connected all the time. He says, abide in me. Stay with me. Connect with me. Hang on to me. If you cannot hang on to me, just call me and I will hang on to you. To follow Jesus means to worship Him. Why do I say to worship? Because if your leader is the primary person in your life, because he is the person you listen to, the person you obey, the person whose opinions matter, he's like God to you, right? Last time, I remember when I, in my teens, they will tell us, um, you cannot put posters of, of pop stars up because that's equivalent to idol worship. Because when you put the, these pictures of pop stars, you're looking at them and you're like thinking how great they are, how wonderful they are. And then now, nowadays, teenagers are not ashamed, you know. The moment you name this group, <laughs> I have it in my class, you know, I'm showing YouTube videos and then at the side they can see and then, teacher, teacher, show that one. Are you so nice, so handsome, so cute. It's like, which one, which one? <laughs> you know? But that's, that's idol worship. So if we are disciples of Jesus, who should you be worshipping? Jesus. Jesus, no need photo. No need poster. Because where is Jesus? In our hearts, right? Those of you who have children, who have taught Sunday school before, where is Jesus? Jesus in your heart. So you no need poster, no need picture. So making disciples of Jesus means you have to teach people how to worship the Lord. This is a very interesting thing, you know. Like, um, if I am a follower of Kai, uh, Kai Ling, Kang Li, then when I want to make other people my disciples, my disciples will also worship me and I will worship Kang Li. But Disciple of Jesus is different because when I make disciples of me, they end up automatically disciples of Jesus. They do not become disciples of me. Because I am Jesus' disciple, what did Jesus say? Die for him. Do I tell my disciple to die for me? Of course not. Lah. But die for Jesus. God doesn't have grandchildren. All of us are sons and daughters. All of us make a personal commitment to Jesus. You don't make a personal commitment to the church, to the pastor, or to anybody. So when we make disciples, we make disciples of Jesus. We don't make disciples of ourselves. What does a disciple have to do? Besides following you need to serve. Now, being a servant is not natural. All of us are basically lazy, right? Some of us have more laziness. Some of us have less laziness. Some of us have more self-discipline that we have trained ourselves such that we control the aspect of laziness in our life so that we carry on and do things as they are. You have this saying that busy people will always make time for important things. Because busy people have learned to manage their time such that they can somehow squeeze another half an hour for something or one hour for something. But the people who have a lot of time will always say, teacher, no time. 
very busy, you know. And then you ask them, what do they do? So I said, can you bathe a little bit faster? Five minutes less. Can you eat lunch a little bit faster? Five minutes less. You see, ten minutes there already. Can practice piano ten minutes, right? This is what teachers do. So all of us are basically lazy. So to serve, it goes against our basic nature. Um, my mom used to get ready this black coffee in the fridge that's only for my father because it's been strained many times so that it's smooth and things like that. So when my father used to walk down the road coming back from, from work, you know, the moment the gate opens, my mom would say, okay, bring your dad's coffee out. So you put it at the dining table, wait, ready for my dad to come in, sit down and just have his cup of coffee. So I, in turn, teach my children the same thing. When the father comes back from work, okay, go and get your father's syrup, get ready. And what was interesting was that um, I heard my second daughter telling my youngest daughter one day, oh, Papa back already, go and get his drink for him. And it just occurred to me, actually, uh, I didn't consciously tell my children to do that. But the eldest girl taught the second one and the second one taught the youngest one. And as parents, who are our disciples? Our children. Whether you like it or you don't like it, okay? Our children, our disciples. Not the CBC teacher, not the PKC teacher, not the Sunday school teacher, not the homeschooling teacher. Parents, you are, in, you are responsible to make disciples of your children. How will they turn out? I have no idea. Whatever it is, we do it in faith. Because we know that Jesus had Judas Iscariot too. It is a personal choice. But parents, we have to disciple our own children. So whether you like it or not, my kids had to come to church when they were young. There was no choice. We didn't ask them anyway. When we come to church for a prayer meeting, they come. When we go for cell group, they go. When we come for music practice, they come. When we come to clean the church for Christmas, they also come. When we are at home baking all the different cakes for Christmas one year, they also help. They didn't have a choice. When you come to church and the chairs are not arranged, who do you call? Child labor, call your children. People ask me, how do I manage child labor? The same goes for Christian principles. Why do we teach our children to pray and give thanks for food? Because we want them to be thankful. We want them to be grateful. We want them to know that it is God who provides. When we serve in church, when we come early, when we come on time, when we do the things we have to do, this is what our children learn from us because it is something that they see, sometimes not something we say. And I dare say only because now they're in their 20s and they're telling me things. But before that, as they were growing up, I can tell you honestly, I'm not sure if my children will do the things we do. I'm not sure if my children would, would love the Lord as much as I do. I do not know if my children would be crazy for God as I would be. But I, I've told my kids many times, it's between, if I have to choose between you and Jesus, you know who wins. Ah. So they will know. If it's got anything to do with God, uh, no need to ask. God first, we all follow. Okay, Jesus came to serve, so we likewise as his disciples, we serve too. Okay, let's go faster. To be a disciple, we have to be a witness. What does a witness do? Like Chong Hyang said, okay, um, if you all can volunteer to be PAKA members, volunteers, we as witness, what do we do? We only have to tell the truth. Tell what you saw, tell what you heard, tell what you know. That's all. So if you know Jesus, what do you tell? You tell about Jesus. 
If you know Jesus forgave your sins, you tell how Jesus forgave your sin. If you know how Jesus healed you, you just tell how Jesus healed you. If you had a problem and Jesus helped you solve it, then you just tell someone how Jesus gave you a solution to your problem. That's all you have to do. Just tell the truth. But to have something to tell, you need to have experience. So if you have not spent time with your Lord, with your Master, you have not spent time with Jesus, you have no stories to tell. So are you a student of Jesus? Is it part-time? Or are you a disciple of Jesus full-time? If you are full-time with Jesus, you have more stories to tell. All these are in your notes, so please go back and read yourself. To be a disciple of Jesus means to point people to Jesus. Okay, can you show me a pointer finger, please? Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is your pointer, okay? All right, show me a pointer, please. Okay, now point to Jesus. Uh, excuse me, where's Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is not there. Jesus is not there. <laughs> Jesus is not there. <laughs> Jesus is in your heart. That's what you all said, right? So your life, your speech, your actions... Is your witness, is your pointer to Jesus as well. Making disciples of Jesus means making fishes of men, making people who in turn will also make disciples for Jesus. I can tell you this because it's, it's my children now. Don't want to use other people's example, okay? Like my children will say things like, um, my daughter is, is in MMU and she's serving in the church there and she told me this. You know, every time when it's near exam period, you know, then the, the person in charge of the worship team will ask me, do I want to take off because of the exams? So I asked her, so what do you say? No need lah. Say, why no need? How much time does it take? Um, just one night before Sunday, that's all, the practice. One hour is okay. Ah. To me, it's uh, time down, you know, no need to study. You can enjoy yourself worshipping God. Lah. So it's just that, and I have to go to church on Sunday anyway, so it's okay. So I was telling my husband, okay, ah, good, she learned it right. <laughs> but it is not something that, that I consciously told my daughter that, you know, you must serve God. You cannot say you have exam, therefore you cannot serve God. Oh, I think I did say that. When they were in primary school, you know, <laughs> yeah. when they were in primary school, I was telling them, exams are not an excuse to cut down on your service to the Lord. Because my kids are not the super kind of super student that half an hour makes so much difference to them. If they didn't come to church for that one hour, they could be sleeping at home for one hour or doing something else for one hour. Definitely not studying and getting better grades for the exam. You know, so what's the point of cutting down on the Lord? And how do you live a life to say that when you are faithful to the Lord, He is faithful to you if you have never sacrificed anything to give to the Lord? Um... I have friends who had to take two buses from Slayang Batu Caves to come to church. And it took her two hours every Saturday. And after church finishes, after the youth meeting finishes, she'll take two hours back. And never uttered a word, never complained. We didn't even know where she stayed until after uh, one particular meeting and someone offered to take her back because it was raining heavily. Then only we realized, my, her sacrifice for God. All of you have stories about the sacrifices that you felt you made for God. But you know that it is a sacrifice of love that you don't feel after you have done it that it was so difficult after all. The difficulty is at that time. 
to do, not to do. To sacrifice, not to sacrifice. To be inconvenienced or not. But once you have made that decision to do it because of your love for Christ, you don't think it's such a great thing that you want to tell everybody about because it's not so difficult after all. But it gets better all the time. And these are your stories for being witness for Jesus. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus. How many times Jesus has not failed you? How many times has Jesus come through for you? That makes laying your life for Him, losing your life for Him, it's not so bad. It's not as difficult as it sounds. So, million dollar question is always how to do it. To be a disciple, you need to be willing, you need to be listening, and you need to be obedient. That means whatever Jesus says, you must be willing. Whatever Jesus says, you must be listening. And whatever Jesus says, you must be obedient. Many times we dare not say we are disciples of Jesus because we think of the many areas in our life that we cannot fully obey. But Jesus says, my yoke is not heavy. My yoke is light. Okay, and we, this is, in the Bible, we have many chapters telling us how to build the tabernacle. In the Bible, we do not have how to make a disciple. But it does not mean that it is not true or it is not practiced. If you read Proverbs 1 to 9, you will know that it is a way of life to disciple. Because if you read Proverbs 1 to 9, it's saying, My son, da 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 do this, don't do this, this is right, this is wrong, this is wise, this is not, what to give up, stay away from this and everything. It is something that is uh, communicated. Because if you think on Jesus' time, no printing press, okay, no books. So there's no um, book on that. We do not have like um, how to disciple in the Bible. The closest I've found is in Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 25. Shall we read this together? Now, this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And the rest of the chapter. Okay, we'll stop there. A disciple needs to be willing. A disciple needs to be listening. A disciple needs to be obedient. To make disciples... What do you need to do? Teach. You need to teach. 
You need to give instruction. What do you teach? If you, can, if you say that I'm not, I, mean, I didn't go for theology, I don't know the Bible so well, whatever, let me make it simple for you. One, you teach. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is what you teach. But before we can teach that, we as disciples of Jesus, we have to love the Lord first with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. What does that mean? That's for you to communicate when you make disciples. How do you love the Lord with all your heart? How do you love the Lord with all your soul? How do you love the Lord with all your strength? That is what you need to teach. As disciples of Jesus, you have no choice but to make disciples. Because Jesus tells you, go and make disciples. So if you are willing, you are listening, and you are obedient, what do disciples of Jesus do? Make disciples. What do you do? Teach them. Teach them how to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. How often do you teach them? You teach them diligently. What it means to be diligent, to be hardworking. You teach them when you don't feel like it and when you feel like it. You teach them when it means you sleep less because you need to spend time teaching them. You teach them when you are at home, sitting down. You teach them when you are out on the road. You teach them when you uh, sit down, walk, uh, rise, lie down, uh, rise, rise up, lie down. All the time. You teach when you are working. You teach when you are doing your hobbies. You teach when it's meal times. All the time. Every time. Because your life is that mirror of Jesus. Your life is that example of what it means to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. When you share about the decisions you make and how you make those decisions because you put God first, you are teaching that disciple of yours how to make decisions with God. When you share about how you go for prayer meeting and what you do at prayer meeting and how to pray, you are making a disciple, you are teaching the disciple how to pray. Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Teacher, teach us how to pray. First question, are you a student of Jesus or are you a disciple of Jesus? You may say, I don't have children, so who do I disciple? Ask Jesus. Could be your neighbor, could be your colleague could be your cell group member, could be your students, could be your sister, could be your brother, could be so many people. Who do you influence? Who do you come into contact with? They say that we may be on the only Jesus that someone will ever meet. People don't want religion. People don't want the do's and don'ts. People want reality. People want life. And if we don't love the Lord with all our heart, soul and mind, and if we don't live a life that shows how real Jesus is in our lives, who wants to be a disciple of Jesus? Nobody. Who's the smartest to you? Einstein? Who's the smartest person in the world to you? If I ask this in children's church, I sure have answer. Who's the smartest person? Jesus! Who's the strongest person? Jesus! Who is the fastest? Who is most powerful? <laughs> Who's the smartest? Ah. Oh. Who's the strongest? Jesus. Who's the most powerful? Jesus. But you have to believe. Huh? 
Because if you believe that, then the, everything that you say and do will reflect what you believe. If someone's asking you, what's your opinion? Huh? Should I take this job or that job? If in your own life, you have always asked Jesus first, which way to go, how to decide, what will you tell the other person? You would tell the other person the same thing that you did. Oh, we should pray about it. You know, what do you feel God is telling you? Does this help you move closer to God or is it drawing you away from God? Will it take more time from you that you feel you cannot spend time with God? You already tell me you have no time to read the Bible. Do you think if you take up this job, you will even have less time to read the Bible? Do you think this is the right job? So if this is the way you make decisions, when you share with somebody, when you make a disciple, this is what the disciple will learn. You cannot tell your disciple, just do what I say, don't do what I do. It doesn't work. Okay, we are all smarter than that. One warning that you have to tell your disciple, and I'm telling you as well. Whatever it is, do not go after other gods. Okay, if you read the rest of Deuteronomy, this is one big warning. Do not go after other gods. Do not tempt the Lord your God. It says in the Bible in many different places, like for example, King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. Why did he lose his kingdom? It says very clearly, because he consulted a medium. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. I just want to remind you all this. Because sometimes we say there are serious sins and there are not so serious sins. I don't know whether Jesus changed his mind along the way. But, you know, many Christians live like there are some sins in one category that we must never do. But there is another category of sins that we should not do, but you and I know that sometimes we do. Uh. But even though you and I know that sometimes we do, we should still remind each other we shouldn't do it. After my Form 5, uh, my friends went to study in Australia and things like that. And then when they come back, we have a get-together. So they asked me, what do you do? Oh, I teach music. You know what's the next sentence that comes out, out of out of five friends? Four of them tell me this. So you don't have to pay income tax, huh? <laughs> don't say that. No, don't do that. Yes, I do pay income tax. Because I fear God more than the tax man. Okay? But that reflects the kind of things we have, okay? Many things you and I do, we know we should not do. So we should remind each other, stop doing it. Not paying income tax is not right. There are laws of the land that we have to obey too. Amen? Okay? Be righteous for Jesus. Be the mirror that reflects Jesus. In your handouts, you have what they call baby steps. This is for a discussion with one another. It's not here. But are you a student of Jesus or are you a disciple of Jesus? If in all honesty, you are a student of Jesus, what is preventing you from becoming a disciple of Jesus. We know that Jesus gave everything for us. What prevents us from giving everything to Him? There was a phrase I caught this week, I'm still trying to find where I read it, where it says that, aren't all the promises in the Bible enough? 
saying that if God doesn't do anything else to answer another prayer, another request from us, isn't all the promises in the Bible enough? It's making me think, what is it that it's not enough for? I'm asking myself, what is it that I'm talking to God about and requesting that all these promises in His Bible cannot fulfill? I was sharing this with the sister last night at supper and I didn't realise until I was talking to her that wow, God answered my prayer and I forgot and I didn't realise it. I, on Saturdays, our practice starts at 5.30 but I finish work at 5 o'clock. By the time the students go off and we lock up, the fastest we drive, we still get here at 5.40. And I still feel bad about it even though I tell this is the best I can do. And I've been telling God, it's not nice to be late even though other people are nice about it. And when, when I went to Perth, one of my teachers replaced my Saturday classes and because she had something on, she asked the students if they could come half an hour earlier. That means we finish at 4.30. And they could. I mean, they made their adjustments and they could. And because the class was already moved up half an hour, I said, continue on, uh, don't, don't shift it back, you know? And now I finish at 4.30. It's so nice. I can pack up nicely, don't have to rush, and still reach church before 5.30. See, God is good. Amen? And it's one of the many promises that God has put in His Word, right? You honour me, I will honour you. God knows the desires of our heart. And that's the wonderful thing about being a disciple of Jesus. You, you don't have to cry and beg and things like that. He just knows what's in you. Because when you love Him, He loves you. You love Him more, and then you know how much more He loves you. And it just goes on. So I want to encourage you. If you think you cannot be a disciple of Jesus, let me encourage you. It's not that bad. It is actually very good. This is why I tell my kids. Why do you give your best to the Lord? Why do you give all to Him? Because Jesus gave everything for you. Jesus gave you his best. So I think it is only fair if you give Jesus your best also. Because if you give Jesus less than your best, then you are cheating God. Because God gave 100%. So we return 100%. Shall we pray? Lord, you are a good, good father. And you gave us the best, Jesus. Lord, we need to see you, to know you. Lord, we want to hunger and thirst for you. We want to desire only you. Lord, we ask that you remove distractions, remove things that, that steal our time, steal our energy, steal our focus, distract us. Because the end of the matter is such that, Lord, we need you and only you. And nothing else matters. Nothing else will matter in eternity. Father, we just pray that our desire is to be more like Jesus. That people will see Jesus in our lives, in our deeds, in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes, Amen. in our acts of service, yes, in our witness, Lord. Yes, Lord. That they will see Jesus. Amen. Amen.